is she enthused? Remember, in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die, was God's command. She ate of the tree, and so she started dying. A, she's still alive, and now she's giving birth. Does she expect this one to be the one that will struggle with the seed of Satan? Is this the Messiah? Is this, I mean, what's going on here? What, what's going through her head? She becomes pregnant, and she has a boy. I have gotten, a man, with the help of the Lord, a man. And again, she bore his brother Abel, which, which uh, is another, we'll talk about that word in just a minute. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep, a herder, and Cain was a worker of the ground. Both very honorable uh, um, you know, professions in the biblical world. Uh, herding sheep, shepherd, huge metaphor, huge issue in the Bible, and then also farming. Of course, the whole world farmed, you realize. They were all agrarian at one point, and so Cain, keeper of the ground. Verse 3, in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. Now, you kind of have to put your Jewish yarmulke on and start thinking back through. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Who's writing this? Oh, yeah, Moses. And Moses is generations after this happened. And Moses has this whole Levitical law thing and the sacrificial system and the dietary code. And So I'm not saying that Moses read back into this, but by the same token, A, what are they bringing an offering for? Is that for sin? Is that to just praise God? Is that, what's the offering about? Some, was there this, this implied feeling they needed to do something to right themselves since the sin of Adam and Eve? I don't know. But anyway, it says they brought an offering from the fruit of the ground. And Abel, verse 4, also brought of the firstborn of his flock. Okay, that wasn't, you. if you were talking about a grain offering that it seems like Cain brought, what would you expect to be in the phrase? Now I'm going to test your knowledge to see how many of you were really listening to Larry. Okay. First fruits, exactly. And the fact that first fruits is not mentioned, is Larry right that maybe he brought the leftovers? See, you would expect it to say the firstborn of the flock and the fat portions. Keep in mind about the Levitical sacrificial system, the fat portions. Okay. And then also not mentioning the first fruits. So that's a possibility. All right, and the Lord had regard. Actually, that's what the ESV says. Maybe your version has a different word here. But it means to gaze with favor, to look upon with favor. Had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. Did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry. Well, did God tell him he wasn't pleased? Did he just assume this? Did he, why the anger? Here, where's that come from? And his face fell. Obviously, if your heart is upset, it will show ultimately in your face. So the countenance has fallen. Verse 6, the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, so here's a warning, isn't it? Sin is crouching at the door. Its desire, very strong word, we'll come back to that, is for you, but you must rule over it. Now that's the same Hebrew word used earlier when God said to Adam and Eve, you shall have dominion over the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and the wild beasts. So the dominion mandate, now the dominion mandate is applied to Cain, and it means you got to take dominion over your sin because it has the ability to choke you. Verse 8. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. So did the warning work? I guess the warning didn't work. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Now, you just kind of want to take pause here for just a minute. This is the first murder of the Bible. Okay. Kills him. Then the Lord said to Cain... Here's another interrogation. Where is Abel, your brother? I guess God didn't know. He said, I do not know. And then this famous line, you've heard it many times. I bet you you've said it. I said it to my mom and dad about my four brothers. <laughs> yes. Am I my brother's keeper? What's the biblical answer for that? Absolutely you are. You have to care for them when they quit caring for themselves. Yes, you do. And the Lord said... 
What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood. I didn't know our blood had voice. Oh, yeah, it does. This is personification. It's pretending that the blood actually is able to speak. Is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground. So God in chapter 3 was giving out curses to creation, to Adam, to Eve, to the serpent. Now it comes to this son, Cain, which has opened his mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. Sound very familiar? Sounds exactly what the curse was for Adam in chapter 3. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. How many of you remember the old television program? The few, boy, I'm really dating myself here. Okay, a few of you brave people are raising your hands. Yeah, the fugitive, this guy that was always on the run because he was su suspected of being a murderer. These words, fugitive and wanderer, actually mean the same thing. They're synonyms, different Hebrew words, but pretty much the same. And it says, Cain said to the Lord, my punishment, actually it means my iniquity. My iniquity is greater than I can bear. Behold, you've driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer. He's kind of doing a self-prophecy here. He's kind of assigning to himself. You know, the little private voices that speak in our heads sometimes are not there by God's design. They're there because we made a mistake, and we start believing our own private heart logic, as Dr. Uh, John Walker says, and that becomes dangerous. So here's what he's doing. The Lord, he says, I'll be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me, thinking judgment will come home to roost, right? Verse 15, then the Lord said to him, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. Now hang on to seven. We'll need that a little later. You know it to be God's perfect number, the number of days in a week, sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain. We'll talk about what that means. Lest any who are found him should attack him. So was this even the grace of God? Was this a way that even though he had sinned terribly against his brother, God was going to somehow protect Cain? Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, at least we can spell that famous place, east of Eden. Now I will just tell you this. Whenever in the Bible God's people go east, it ain't going to end well. When they go to Shinar or they end up in Babylonian captivity, they're always going east. So east sort of represents the bad lands, if you will. Uh, think of J.R.R. Tolkien or something like that, Lord of the Rings. Anyway, uh, Middle Earth, all of that stuff. Okay, let's back up and notice a few things here. Uh, here's some of your notes. Number one, Adam and Eve had no children mentioned, I said mentioned, previous to the fall. Could they have had children before Cain? Well, it is a possibility for sure. Josephus, and if you want the reference, there it is. In his book, The Antiquities of the Jews, book one, chapter two, paragraph two, footnote eight. Is that specific enough for you? Okay. Josephus, now Josephus lives when? At the time of Jesus, just after the time of Jesus. Jewish historian, was a Pharisee, was divorced, sold his soul to Rome to write the, the, uh, about the wars of the Jews and the antiquities of the Jews. But he is the major, even if he exaggerates, the major first century historical voice for us, Josephus. Dr. Paul Meyer, who teaches at Western Michigan University, is an expert on Josephus. And he's even written a book on Pontius Pilate, a novel, a historical novel on Pontius Pilate. But Paul Meyer is his name. His dad was the voice, do you remember anybody way back, the voice of the Lutheran Hour? Years ago on, t on the radio, there was the Lutheran Hour. And Walter Meyer was the speaker on the Lutheran Hour. And actually, it was very good. He was a good Bible expositor. Uh, fact of the matter is, when he went in to take his oral defense for his Old Testament Hebrew stuff, he walked into the room, and the guys who were PhDs that were going to examine him stood up and then bowed to this student who was going to take his oral defense because they knew that he knew the text much better than they did. They knew that much. Now, this is Paul Meyer, Walter Meyer's son, that's an expert on this sort of thing, Josephus. So Josephus says this on your notes that Adam and Eve had 33 sons and 23 daughters. How many of you does that just exhaust right now? It's just like, Lord have mercy. You've got to be kidding me. 
But, you know, after Methuselah, 969 years, guess who's second place, third place? It's Adam. So could there have been the time frame of that? And Genesis 5, 4, which we'll not get to tonight, says that Eve, Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters. Now hang on to that. We're going to need that when we get down to verse 17. But anyway, it would seem, in light of Eve's delight at Cain's birth, that he could very well be the firstborn. I don't think you have to take that position, but you could take that position because she seems pretty excited about it. But not only did Eve not die, but now she's had a baby. She's gotten somebody from God. And Cain's name will be mentioned 13 times in this chapter alone. And the fact that she has a baby and that she's still alive is once again a mark of the grace of God. Now, one other thing that Larry raised in his sermon which is number two. Could Cain and Abel have been twins? Well, it's certainly possible. That's for sure. Um, you know, uh, 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 we, but we, we need to remember this. When we read those two verses there, a lot of time could have well have passed here. If they're not twins, we know we've got how much time in just verses 1 and 2? I mean, just do the math, ladies. We got 18 months for sure, but then Adam, uh, uh, Cain and Abel are what? Babies? No, they're adults. So this is something we have to remember all the time when we're studying our Bibles, is that within a few verses, you can move years of time. And that may be exactly here. So whether they're twins or not, I'm not exactly sure. It is a strong possibility, I suppose. But these boys have now become men. And their professions, number three, were very noble. The issue of farming and the issue of shepherding are occupations that the Bible holds in high regard. You may remember that by the time Moses wrote this, Okay, And by the time, actually before that, when Father Jacob makes it down to Egypt, they have to live in the land of Goshen because the Egyptians didn't like shepherds. Whatever the prejudice was, they didn't like them. And so, but as far as the Bible's concerned, shepherding is the main metaphor for leadership in Old and New Testament, in the church and in Israel. So, noble occupations. So why are the boys bringing an offering to the Lord? Well, the text does not tell us this. We know in the Mosaic dispensation that they brought offerings to the Lord, lambs, bullocks, rams, turtle doves, for sin purposes. There was the burnt offering, the sin offering, the grain offering. All these offerings were to somehow make atonement for sin. Now we get to the New Testament and we realize from the book of Hebrews that God was just kind of putting all of those at, at bay because the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin, right? That's what Hebrews teaches. So there would come a later time where God would load up those sins on his own son. Okay, but is it for atonement or is it just thanks? Thank you for another sheep being born in the flock. Thank you for the uh, food from the field that has come. It might be very much that. So the boys are bringing an offering to the Lord, whatever motivate that. Not told what kind of offerings these are, but again, Moses had a reservoir of understanding from his world that he could have brought to this table. Now, um, like later he Hebrews would do, and I, by Hebrews I don't mean the book of Hebrews, later the Hebrew family, uh, Abel would bring the firstborn of his flock. There's nothing wrong with Cain, <coughs> excuse me, Cain's grain offering. Because grain offerings were very acceptable to God. There's quite a bit in Leviticus about that. The difficulty or the challenge would be that uh, is it the first fruits of the grain offering? Or is it, as Larry said, the leftovers? Was that what was going on? Okay, now let's get to number five. Let's talk about that. What does God, having regard for Abel's offering, mean? It means he looked favorably upon it. He looked upon it with grace. So what else could be part of this? Let's just raise some other possibilities. I think Larry has given us a, a good, strong possibility that it could be that Cain brought the leftovers and Abel brought the best of his flock. The, the fat portions and, and the firstborn, if you will. But here are some other options. Letter A under number five. Some say that Cain's offering wasn't a lamb. A lamb, of course, would be a blood sacrifice. But I'll remind you again, grain offerings were acceptable. 
But you know, there are a lot of people that will say, well, the thing that holds the whole Bible together, the thread that holds it together, is not just the Messiahship of Jesus, it's not just the kingdom of God, but it's the red line, the scarlet thread of redemption, blood, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And so because Abel, Cain didn't bring a blood offering, that was the problem. Well, it's a possibility. Some suggest that. By the way, if you think I'm just uh, toying with this, I knew a preacher that actually had to leave a church one time because of this very text right here. That the church people felt one way about this and he felt another way and it got to where it got to be a problem and he finally had to resign. Why do we do stuff like this when we really don't know? We just don't know. Here's letter B. Some say that Cain's offering was not offered in faith. And we do have to do everything we do in faith. Confession is useless without faith. Repentance is useless without faith. Baptism is ridiculous without faith. So let's just go over to Hebrews 11 verse 4 for a minute. Here's what it says. You know this phrase all the way through Hebrews 11. By faith, and this is about Abel, offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice. Well, again, was it because it was the firstborn of the flock? Was it because it was bloodline? Was it because, what was it for? Keep reading. More acceptable than a cane through which he was commended as righteous. Okay, now just pause. I'm not saying that Paul wrote Hebrews necessarily, but uh, righteousness comes by virtue of having faith in Jesus Christ. So this gives a little credence to this view, I think. God commending him by accepting his gifts, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. I'm using that phrase this coming Saturday in a funeral in Illinois because uh, uh, that you've heard this phrase a lot, that though he is dead, yet he speaketh. Okay, In the case of the one that we are going to have, the, he was a singer. So I'm going to change it and just say, though he is dead, yet he singeth. I've got that liberty because I'm a preacher. So anyway, there. Um, now, let her see. Some say that Cain's heart, which would be expressed in his deeds, was already evil. So let's go over to 1 John. 1 John chapter 3, verse 12 says, We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one. We all know that in this study as the serpent. And murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Maybe that's what made his offering unacceptable. Is that his heart was not righteous. Not just that he didn't have faith in God. Not just that he didn't offer a blood sacrifice. But that his, in his heart he was evil. Already that had demonized the culture. Some would say, this is item D, that Cain's offering was performed out of duty instead of delight. God tells him in chapter 4 verse 7 that he could do well. And the word means he could do that which was pleasing. He could do that which was merciful. But he chooses not to do that. So I guess what I want to say at this point, gang, is <coughs> pay your money, pick your choice. There's a number of reasons that you could argue why Cain's offering was not acceptable. Here are some that scholars talk about. I don't know any way to resolve it completely, but anyway, his offering was not looked upon, gazed upon favorably. Now, item six there. Cain allowed his anger to show up in fallen countenance. And that just, unless you're really good at being a hypocrite, I guess you caught that phrase, uh, you know, this is pretty much the case. Your face will pretty much show what's in the heart. I've told you before about teaching preaching classes all those years, and once the students would preach in the morning in class, in the afternoon, I would meet with them privately and go over the videotape. And sometimes, you know, I had to get, reach up and turn off the sound and just say, look at yourself. Just look at yourself. And I'd say, what do you see? And they said, well, it looks like I'm angry. I'm scowling. I said, that's right. That's right. What was your topic? Love of God. Well, I said, could you tell your face, please? So, yeah, somehow the countenance follows the heart. God tries to reason with him and even warn him. Now, the God of the Bible, this is another evidence of God's grace. It's like a parent saying to a child, yeah, I guess you can do that, but I need to tell you something. You have the freedom to do that, but I need to tell you what will come with that choice, because it's a bad choice. And so that's what God is doing here. Now, it does say in the text, sin is crouching at the door. Guess what, sports fans? That's the first time the word sin appears in the Bible. We saw it in chapter 3, but the actual word 
which in the New Testament has this idea of uh, 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 missing the mark. In the broader scope of Scripture, it's transgressing the law. First John says, sin is transgressing the law. God draws a line in sand, and you step across it. That's what it is. So, first time sin in the Bible is crouching at the door. You kind of think of a lion that's kind of ready to pounce on its prey. God challenges him to rule over his desires, which is a word that means your longings or your cravings. Now, this word desire appeared earlier on, you know, in our study. In chapter 3, here it is again, and the only other time it will appear in the Old Testament, this particular Hebrew word, is in the Song of Solomon, the Song of Songs, talking about the strong desire that a husband has for his wife and the wife has for her husband in intimacy. So it's a very strong word. It's got a lot in it. And I guess because it's about this idea of longings and cravings is why Brother Wilson used to say at the school that repentance is not just the changing of belief. It does mean to change the mind. Repentance does. The, the Greek word actually means that. Um, it doesn't mean the changing of belief. It doesn't mean the changing of behavior. It doesn't even mean the changing of direction. Brother Wilson says repentance is a changing of the affections. I think he's right. It's the changing of desires. Okay? It's like that person who said, you know, since I became a Christian, I do anything I want to. The only difference is Jesus changed all my want tos. I just want different things I used to want. Okay, so that's this challenge to him. Number seven, Cain rises up and kills his brother. And you know, you just, you, we read through that so fast, you just kind of got to go back through all the psychology of that and think about it for just a minute. And God interrogates Cain as he had done with Adam and Eve back in chapter four, verse nine, he does that. Cain tried to evade and be dismissal. Am I my brother's keeper? And the word keeper, by the way, is the idea of watchman. There does seem to be an implied thing about the human family. We are to take good care of one another. We are to be the watch. Sometimes when people have failed to care for themselves, we have to care for them. God personified Abel's blood and, and cursed Cain, chapter 4, verses 10, 11. And as with Adam, God cursed Cain as well as the ground. So here you have anger, murder, and wandering. Now, if you will... Let's, uh, let's go on with this just a little bit on the back side of your sheets there. We're going to land on this just a bit. And number eight is Cain would end up being a fugitive. He would end up being a, which is a word that means to quiver, to shake, to totter. And I guess that's what a fugitive does. They're always looking around the corner. They're always watching carefully, okay? And a wanderer, very similar word, vagabond, someone who moves to and fro on the earth. Cain is overwhelmed by this. He thinks it's too much for him to bear. His iniquity or his fault has found him out, and it's more than he can bear. Well, here's a question for you. Is it? Does anybody know of a promise we have in Scripture that God won't let that happen? How about this one? 1 Corinthians 10, by the way, all arrogance has to be removed because the verse ahead of this quotes the Proverbs, which means, no, pride comes before a fall. But this is what it says. No temptation, and you do have to underline that word, has overtaken you that is not common to man. You're not the only fish in the sea. Don't believe that you're the only one this has ever happened to. God is faithful. That's at the heart of this, the statement of God. And he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. Now, there are an awful lot of people out there that have this wrong, I think. Uh, one time I was asked to go down to preach in Georgia at a church there. I think I've told you about this church before. Corinth Christian Church. <laughs> Why anybody would name their church Corinth, they need shot. But anyway, um, Corinth Christian Church. And they were doing a series of messages entitled, The Bible Does Not Say That. And, and uh, the point is, we, we have all these things that we think the Bible says when it really never said that at all. And I don't know how many times I've heard somebody say, God won't let you be tested beyond what you can stand. But this seems pretty overwhelming to me. I never said that. I grant you that the Greek word pyrazo is the same word for test and tempt as it is for trials, to go through trials. But the enemy always tests us to defeat us. God always stretches us and makes us give, has trials to stretch us. So, so the goal is totally different here. I don't know anywhere in the Bible where it says that you won't be tempted, you won't have to endure more than you can endure. Job was pretty much thinking, I think God has left me. Okay? There are times in our lives when we have to say, wow, this is the, the, I can't do this. This is overwhelming to me. The promise is temptation. And so we pray, uh, keep us from evil. 
Keep us from the evil one. Deliver us from temptation in the, in the model prayer. So just remember that, that God, I guess what I'm trying to say is, God is holding Cain responsible for his actions because he's not going to let him be tempted beyond what he can handle. Okay. God even countered that fear by putting a mark, which is a Hebrew word that actually means a token or a banner on Cain, to protect him from an untimely death. God's grace here for this boy is that he didn't want him to experience what he had created as an experience for his brother. Interesting. And notice the use of the word sevenfold here, uh, as well as in the next section. The word seven features prominently here. So what does he do? Cain heads away to live in the east, the land of Nod, which interestingly enough, that's a word that means wandering. And whenever I said it earlier when we read it, whenever God's people go east, they usually get in trouble. Whether it's Babylon or wherever, that just seems to be it is. Now, if you think that this is just a new, an Old Testament theme, let me have you think again. Because the book of Jude, in verse 11, as it's describing the, the false teachers, says this. Woe to them, for they walked, I mean the false teachers, in the way of Cain. So is it possible for us to do that? This is to New Testament people. This is the church he's writing to. Avoid the way of Cain and abandon themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's heir. Wow. He moved from Genesis 4 to Numbers 22 to 24. Goodness. And perished in Korah's rebellion. Anybody remember Korah and the earth opening up and swallowing Korah because he opposed Moses' leadership? So the book of Jude here, Jude, by the way, the half-brother of Jesus, who's writing this, is all over the Old Testament map. With this remark, we have to avoid the way of Cain. All right, so let me just pause right there and say, what's the best way to do that? Here's a guy that gives full vent to his anger, commits murder. By the way, do you remember anywhere in the Bible that those two things are put side by side? You have heard that it was said to the men of old, thou shalt not murder. But I say to you, anybody who even thinks evil of his brother has already murdered in his heart. That's the Lord Jesus. So why does the New Testament teach about this? In the book of Ephesians, what does it say? He says, be angry but don't sin. Now sometimes in the King James Version, people think that that means that it's a command to be angry. Actually, the indicative and the imperative are the same ending, so you have to determine from the context, and here's the point. I think Paul is saying, you will get angry. There were things that make you angry. In a fallen world, you can't help that. Anybody ever get angry at 5.30 at night with me? And it doesn't matter what channel you're watching. It's all the same message, Romans 3.23. I get angry when I hear on the news about some guy that took a little girl and mistreated her. I get angry. I can pummel that guy till he bleeds. But I can't sin with my anger. That's the difference. Don't let the sun go down to your anger. Say, okay, I'm going to move to Greenland. Uh, don't let the, no, that doesn't work. So anyway, avoid the way of Cain. Be careful. Avoid this like the plague. Um, I'll just go ahead and say, a lot of the guys that are in prison today, if you trace their family backgrounds, one of two issues. One, father problems. Two, anger issues. Just goes without saying. So, so avoid the way of Cain. We've got anger and giving rise to it, murder. By the way, the Bible says, put away all anger, Ephesians 4. Wrath, malice, clamor, put, put it all away. Just give it no life. Put it to death. It never serves us very well. Okay, We don't do anger well. God does anger very well, but we don't do anger very well. Okay, now with that, let's go to the next part here because <laughs> here's my cheerful remark for you. It gets worse. Okay, let's take a look. Cain's descendants. Oh, family patterns. Family patterns, right? Uh, we can perpetuate things. Hurt people, hurt people. You've heard these kind of expressions before. And that's exactly what we have here in the descendants. Uh, you know, so let's look at it. Verse 17. Cain knew his wife. Whoa, stop, hold it. What's her name? Sally. No, I just made that up. Uh, where did she come from? And this is people's oftentimes objection. Well, where did Cain get his wife? You, know, uh, you just kind of want to say... Are you as dumb as you look? But anyway, let's. Cain, because what? She conceived and bore Enoch. 
When he built a city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. Well, that's a humble little thing, isn't it? Okay. To Enoch was born Arad, and Arad was born Mahuchalel, and Mahuchalel was fathered Methushael, and Methushael fathered Lamech. All right, now the next thing is stunning, because this is the first time in human history for this. And Lamech took two wives. So we move from pride to polygamy, and you will see pride in this man's life. The name of the one was Adah, and the name of the other was Zalah. Adah bore Jabel. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. So like Abel, right? He's a shepherd of some kind, a herder. Uh, he's probably one of the very first, what we would call in the world even today, a Bedouin. That word actually means tent dweller. Okay? A Adab or Jabel, he was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. <laughs> they weren't real creative, you know, back then. <laughs> Jabel, Judah, Muppin and Huppin and Ard and all those people you read about in the Bible. Not, not, not really great. Anyway, we can spell them. So his brother's name was Jubal. His father was, uh, he was the father of all who play the lyre and the pipe. Wow, very early in culture, even in pagan fallen culture. What have you got? Music. God's little kindness to try to make life in this fallen, stained planet a little better. Okay, music. Wow. Zalah also bore Tubal-Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. So he's a Tim the Toolman Taylor. Works for Benford, of course. The sister of Tubal-Cain was Nehemiah. And Lamech said to his wives, plural, Adah and Zalah, Shema. It kind of rings in English, doesn't it? When you say that, hear, oh, my voice, you wives of Lamech, Shema to what I say. Hear what I say. I've killed a man for wounding me. Does he sound like he's proud of this? And can I tell you the word for wound actually means bruised? Hmm. A young man for striking me. And you just kind of want to say, Lamech, pick on somebody your own size. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. Hmm. Wonder if Jesus will ever pick up on that little remark. Now we'll go ahead and read this last part. And Adam knew his wife again. See, from the perspective of Moses, we're only highlighting those individuals that will play a big role in the story. Why didn't Moses tell about the other 33 boys and 23 girls? Because they won't play. Listen, your Bible's not intended to be complete. It's not a scientific textbook. It's, not, it's intended to give us the story of God redeeming the universe. So this is, he knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also was born, and he call, a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. So Cain's son is Enoch, and this one is Enosh. And at that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord, whatever that might mean, crying out for salvation, or maybe it's a reference to prayer. Let's look at our notes here just a little bit. The Bible says Cain knew who? <laughs> Where did Cain get his wife? Well, could be a sister, 33 boys, 23 daughters, or a niece. Does the Bible forbid this? Well, depends on what state you live. No, I'm not saying that. Uh, does the Bible forbid this? Not really until the time of Moses. And a lot of the scholars believe that this prohibition was finally given during the Mosaic Dispensation to protect against the mutations that had developed over the long downward spiral of sin and death uh, of both parents. By the time you move from this era of history to Moses' era, there had been enough intermarriage and stuff that mutations were beginning to take place. How many of you, this will date us all, had to get a blood test before you got married? Raise your hands. Yeah, yeah. Pretty common in those days, right? Anyway, today, in keeping with the Mosaic Dispensation, we would talk about family connection. That would be incest. 
But at this point, there's nothing about that. Keep in mind what we would call progressive revelation or census plenure, the fuller sense of what the Bible means as the Bible story unfolds for us. All right, number two, Cain's family tree. Uh, compare it with Seth's messianic line in the next chapter. Now, there's a little bit thing to notice because the number seven, I told you, would feature prominently here. <coughs> Excuse me. Enoch, uh, the city by the same name. Erod, which means fleeting. Mahuchael means smitten by God. Methushael, by the way, you recognize the last letters of those names? El, El, El Shaddai, Elohim, El. So even the pagan line of Cain is trying to hearken back to God somehow, who is of God. And then Lamech, whose name means powerful. Well, yeah, he was powerful. He picked on a little boy. That was his power. So here's what I'd have you say. I think I'd, I'll go ahead and jump down if I didn't say this already. I don't see it in my notes right here right now. <coughs> but Lamech is the seventh generation from Adam. And he is like messed up. Who's the seventh generation from Adam on Seth's line? Glad you ask. Enoch, who according to the next chapter, walked with God. And his boy was named Methuselah. Honor thy father and mother in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Why? So that you might have a long life. Enoch's epitaph, so you got the seventh generation from Adam in Seth's line, Enoch, seventh generation from uh, Cain's line, uh, Lamech, who's messed up. <coughs> Excuse me. Anyway, let's, let's read on with this. Um, the stunning statement, of course, is Lamech had two wives. This is the first time in human history we read this. Ada means uh, ornament. Zalah means shade, whatever we're to do with that. Abel bore Jabel, which name means stream of water. And then look how early music, excuse me, stream of water, the same occupation as Abel, a stream. First Bedouin, if you will. <coughs> uh, Ada also bore Jubal. His name means stream of music, which makes sense. So, how early music came along. Um, that is a lyre, and if you didn't know, it's a harp-like instrument. It's to be strummed like a guitar or an instrument similar to that, but that's a lyre, okay? And this is a reed instrument. The word pipe uh, means that you'd kind of, anybody play the clarinet or the saxophone in here? Okay, so that's the kind of instrument we're talking about, something with a reed, and so very early on, music is here, maybe to help us with uh, the difficulties of this world. So it also says that Zillah bore Tubalcane, who was a metal worker, and Tubal-Cain's sister was also named Naamah. We're not told why Naamah is, uh, is mentioned here. Her name means loveliness. Thank you, Roger. I am continuing to struggle with a cough. Aren't you glad I'm far away from you? Um, anyway, lovely. I'm, I'm not sure why Naamah's name is mentioned. I'm not exactly sure about that. But anyway, consider Lamech's boast here. Shema and Shema. Here, wives. So I guess each wife gets a Shema. I don't know. He's boasting of murder, and evidently of a man, the Hebrew word actually means male, and a young man, and it does mean youth or child at that. The young man only bruised Lamech. So I guess I'd ask, does the crime of murder fit the offense? It's like somebody gave full vent to anger here, and that's what I wanted to say. So you want to say pick on somebody your own size. Then Lamech compares his punishment to that of Cain's. That's very interesting. It's almost like he's bragging that he can be avenged for what he's done way beyond what happened to Cain. And there is this little scripture, if you will. Oh, shoot. Yeah. In Jesus' fourth uh, discourse in the Gospel of Matthew, he tells a story about uh, forgiveness. And at one point in the story, Simon Peter says to him, Lord, how many times shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven? Well, Peter probably thinking he's being extremely generous because the rabbis taught three. But Jesus says, not seven. Now, older versions of this will say, but 70 
times seven. So the 491st time you can belt them right in the mouth, right? No. The idea of seven is the number of clothes. So whether he means 77 or whether he means 490, it matters little. The point is whether he's exaggerating or whether he's just saying, no, this, there, there, this is, is this the playoff? Most people, scholars who talk about the Matthew 18 text, will say Jesus is drawing upon the very imagery from Lamech in Genesis 4. The downward spiral of sin. Here's where we are, Romans 1. The last verse in Romans 1 says this. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. That's the difference between Lamech and Cain. He's giving full approval to this. All right. Now, come to number five here. This story of pride and polygamy is countered in the last few verses, 25 and 26. They kind of redeemed the chapter a little bit. Seth, whose name means compensation, is born. Seth had a son named Enosh, man. So here is what we see. Seventh generation, there's my notes about that, is we go to Lamech and we go to Enoch and there's a vast, vast difference. Hebrews 11 verse 5 says, by faith Enoch was taken up. Well, what does that mean? I guess he didn't die. So that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And what does the next verse say? For without faith, it is impossible to please God. For everyone who uh, would believe in him must uh, believe in him that he's the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So anyway, here's what's going on in my opinion. What we have here is what Francis Schaeffer many years ago called the two great lines of humanity. The sons of Seth, and notice the New Testament phrase, and the way of Cain. And it, show, it goes ahead and comes down through history this way to us. It's the way of Seth and the way of Cain. It's Israel and the nations. It's the remnant and Israel. It's the church and the world. It's the kingdom of man and the kingdom of God. What we have in Genesis 4 as we come out of Genesis 4 are the two great lines of humanity. And it kind of goes back to what John Kerr said to us last week about Genesis 3.15. Is that the first preaching of the gospel or is it the first preaching of the conflict between two groups of people in the world? Therefore, I would say this to you. I would quote my good friend J.K. Jones to you once again. We are really best for our world when we are most unlike it. When there's a clear counter distinction between us and the way the world is, that becomes the attractive power for the world to come over to God's side. So here are some applications as we close tonight. Number one, God goes out of his way to warn people about sin. Um, this coming Sunday night, I'm supposed to be over at Carterville to do a two-hour lecture on the final week of Jesus' life. They're leading up to their Good Friday service. And so you can't, you can't do that study, you can't put that stuff together without seeing that Jesus gave Judas every opportunity to turn around. Jesus was like flashing red lights in Judas's eyes. I mean, he's called the son of perdition, and it was supposed to work out this way. And yet, Jesus seems to hold him responsible for what he did. He walked right by the light, but he chose to live in the shadows. <laughs> he ended up dying for his own sins. But he didn't have to. And he's held responsible. God in his mercy was trying to get his... I mean, can you imagine when he comes up to him in the garden and Judas says, Rabbi. And he kisses him to this cheek and kisses him to this... And Jesus says, friend. Wow. He's trying to get his attention. See? When he dipped that in the dish and said, the one who betrays me is the one who's eating with me at the table. Well, that could only be John or Judas because they're the ones sitting by him. And he turns and he gives it to Judas because Jesus' head is in Judas' chest. So this is the thing that God would do. The, the wonderful thing about God is he warns us to trust his goodness. God even protects people who fail to take his warnings. You would think, you'd read this story and you'd go, well, God should have just nailed Cain's hide to the wall. Actually, what he did was they put a mark on him so nobody would kill him. Wow, is he giving him time to repent? Number two. Evidently, we are responsible for one another. 
Doesn't the New Testament say this? Bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. So we are our brother's keeper. We do have to care that much. Number three, God exercises patience when dealing with sinful people. He allowed some good things to come from the line of Cain. What good things? Like herding sheep. Like music. You need music in a fallen world. <laughs> and like even tools. How many of you have ever tried to fix something without the right tool? I have, I have a track record for this. I mean, you know, I don't know why that hammer won't work to turn that screw. You know, anyway. So, uh, wow. God works within a broken world to give it a little bit of happiness. But left to ourselves, we will destroy one another. That's exactly what Galatians says. If we bite and devour one another, we will consume one another. Then number four, God begins to draw a line between two groups of people. If the biggest thing to come out of this chapter tonight is this, just remember this, that we come out between the line of Seth and the way of Cain. One we are to avoid like the plague, one we are to get in. Because that will be the line of the Messiah. When we start tracing the line of the Messiah into this next chapter, it will be because of the way, the, the, the line of Cain, or Seth, excuse me, the line of Seth. God is making compensation for us. Well, that's the downward cycle. That's the downward uh, spin. It's not very happy until you get to the end of the chapter. And then you realize, I have been given the privilege of choosing well. So help me, God, to choose well. All right? Well, let's pray, and we'll be dismissed tonight. Next week, we will look at all these ages of people. What are we to do with all these people lived a long time? I have no interest in doing that, okay, at all. But uh, anyway, I guess if it's God's calling to you, you do it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for even difficult chapters like this that uh, really give us pause to think that here you have brothers that would have animosity toward one another, at least one to one. And uh, we pray that you would deliver us from such, a, such an evil. Help us not to harbor anger in our hearts. Help us to let it go to you, knowing that you do vengeance better than we ever could. And we pray that we would not be proud, that we would be humble, and we would listen to your voice. And I want to thank you, God, for in the midst of even our fallenness, giving us jobs, giving us music, giving us tools, so we can kind of make our way, even in the midst of a difficult world. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.